Rejected and rejected Don't look so sad or so dejected I don't mean to brag and I don't mean to boast But I'm a six-course meal and you're just burnt toast Think I'm gonna have a give up? No, never Come on, you're just making noise Listen to my music, destroys Anything you throw at me I'm gonna throw it back, just wait and see You better believe I got tricks up my sleeves And I captivate Cause I'm powerful and great You better believe I got tricks up my sleeves See me nominate Cause I'm powerful and Hello. Welcome to Dr. Crow's Magic School, the very first episode of a new series I'm trying out. Uh, in this episode, and in, in this whole series, I'm going to be showing off videos specifically relating to the history of magic, history of magicians, which will be later episodes, um, as well as the care and maintenance for the props used in the magic tricks. I will be revealing how the magic tricks are done. So spoilers on that for anybody who does not want to know how magic is done. But those will be at the end of the history of the magic. Uh, so we will go over the history of the magic first. Then I will reveal how the trick is done. And then we'll go into the care and maintenance of the props. So that way, if you're just curious about the history of, of the um, variety of different routines, tricks, performances, and magicians, whatever we're covering on that specific episode, you'll be able to watch and then bug off before we get into the more technical stuff. And at the end of all the technical stuff, we will go over a couple of performances uh, by the magic. Magi either by the magician we're covering or of the magic trick that we are studying. I am <laughs> a little nervous. I've never actually taught anything like this before, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Let's see who's joining us in the class today. I see you, Blue Teddy Narrations. Hiya. How you doing? I see you, DWLW, working in the back. Good to know. Good to know. I hope we entertain you and educate you as well. So for our first video that we will be covering today, we will be covering, we'll start with a performance, of course. So that way you get a little bit of the magic very first. Now this is one of my favorite magicians of all time, Paul Daniels. And, of course, we are covering, in the very first episode, a rabbit from a hat. Very, the staple of magic, uh, one would consider. Uh, this, along with sawing a lady in half, are the two tricks people think of first when they think of a magician. So we'll be going over his very specific performance for a rabbit from a hat. So enjoy. Thank you. Very nice. A long time ago, the very first Royal Command performance had on it a magician. The most famous magician in London at the time was David Devan, a great magician. And in those days, well, magic was different to the way that I present it. It was a lot different. And uh, nowadays, the children look at the badge of... So uh, right off the bat, I just want to add in a little bit of commentary. He mentions Devant, uh, most famous magician at that time. Devant is very critical to the history and the impact Rabbit from the Hat has had on magicians and pulp culture in general. And we'll get a little bit more into him a little bit later. 
And Devon's definitely going to be one of these magicians who gets his own episode in this series. I'm going to be saying that a lot about magicians eventually. The magician. And when they look at the badge of the magician, they see him, he's always pulling a rabbit out of something. And the children are confused. So I thought I'd go back a little way in magic and... Uh, present that trick to you tonight. Um, so let's do it. Can I have a round of applause for my lovely assistant, Miss Debbie McGee? She always helps me, and she's here tonight. Hi, Debbie. Now, she has to do something very strange, the strange slopes, as it always did in those days. So they used to lower something at the back for the magician to stand on, and then the table did not escape, and the orchestra finished up doing the act. Now, children, if you are viewing, this is important. That is not a vase, a vase, or a vase. That is a hat, a top hat. Nowadays, nobody wears them. But in Victorian times, when a man went to the disco, <laughs> that was on his head. That was the top hat. Oh, and the trick was dead easy. Pulling a rabbit from a hat was really easy. Because in those days, they had a different fashion again. They had fat sleeves, not this thin stuff. So all they had to do was this. All they had to do was they just leaned on a piece of scenery, and once they were on the scenery like that, they would talk. And as they talked away, someone would drop a rabbit down the sleeve. See? Oh, it's true. This is where the expression obviously comes from, rabbiting on. Now. <laughs> okay, so what he's talking about right now with the whole leaning on a piece of prop, stage prop or scenery and rabbiting on, as he says, it's, as far as my studies into this topic has gone, this is not true. At least from what I've seen. It's definitely not how the rabbit from a hat is done today. If ever at all. <laughs> oh, but it's so charming. So charming. The moment the rabbit was in there, the magician would turn away from the wings and he would smile. He would sparkle. His eyes would flash. He would catch every eye in the theater. And why? because he had a big bulge here going like this. <laughs> he would approach the hat, straighten his arm, the rabbit would go zonk into the bottom of there. Zonk, and it would, poor little rabbit would lay there, like that. Thinking, my agent promised me a part in Watership Down, and here I am now. <laughs> so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I should like to present for you all a world-famous rabbit from a hat. Thank you. This has nothing to do with the trick. This is just union rules for magicians. <laughs> Please, however, take note that there is nothing at all up this sleeve. Here we... <laughs> I'll start again. There's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. We're gonna pause just real quick so that way uh, YouTube doesn't get upset at me. All right. And as you can all, you stand at this end of the table to do the trick. It's the only way. And then you reach into the hat and you produce a rabbit. You keep hold of the hat. And then having kept hold of the hat, the magician would reach in and produce a rabbit. From a hat. And there it is, a rabbit. <laughs> There's no rabbit. <laughs> That's not a rabbit, that's a hare. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the trick that has fooled millions. <laughs> it's for children, missus, all right? It's for children. Nobody said it was designed to fool an adult. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I can't find the rabbit, but I am a professional magician. I carry a sp now, uh, talking about the hole in the hat in the table and the rabbit obviously being just underneath the table. You wouldn't believe this, but this is actually how it was done. This is not how it's done anymore because obviously there's a big flaw in the fact that there's a hole in your hat in the table. <laughs> and that's not going to be the way I teach you how to perform the rabbit from the hat. 
but I love the way that he does it in this. It's so hilarious having the rabbit all the way on the other side of the table. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the classic rabbit from a hat. <laughs> I think the pesky rabbit is trying to get away. I shall sneak up on the pesky rabbit. The moment we have all been waiting for, especially me. Rabbit my hat! Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. They see, that's not supposed to be there at all. That's supposed to be on a hook right around, around the back of the table. You see that? <laughs> and there it goes. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You do not laugh. You do not applaud. Until the magician produces a rabbit from a hat. Like that. And there it Hello. is. Hello. The adorable little bunny. Now, I stay a while here just to point something out because I know a lot of people love animals and worry. Don't worry about Starsky. We call him Starsky. He's got a hutch upstairs. No. Uh -oh. You know <laughs> Okay. The hole in the hat is always bigger than he would tunnel in the ground, ladies and gentlemen. Always. Always bigger than he would tunnel in the ground. And just in case you thought that was a fluke, this is his big trick. Go on, son. Out you pop. Yes, daddy loves you. And a lot of people pick up their animals by the ears. Never do that, children. Yes, That's do dangerous. not pick Come up a rabbit by the Get ears. The Take a bow. Don't forget the box. That's the box. And off you go. Bye now. All right. And that was Paul Daniels' uh, rabbit from a hat routine. It's a wonderful, wonderful bit of magic. All right. So he does bring up some important facts there at the end um, about don't pull the rabbit by the ears. Don't do that. Obviously, it hurts them. You don't want to pull them up by the scruff either. They're a, rabbits are a prey animal. So you don't want to pick them up the same way a hawk would pick up a, a rabbit either. You want to be very gentle and kind with the bunny because people don't like seeing animals get hurt when they go to watch a magic show. Hello, Jim and I, Samimi. It's good to see you. Good to see you. You can change your name all you want, but I know it's you. <laughs> all right. So, our first. So, we have watched the performance. So, now we will go into the history of the magic trick. So this is a channel I discovered recently while starting to do research for this whole thing called Act of Illusion. And his whole thing is Act of Impossible. I'm sorry. His name is Act of Impossible. And his whole thing is just teaching the history of magic. And I think that's very important. He's a very young channel still. He has just over 2,000 subs. And there are there's links to all the videos I'm using in the lesson today down below. Um, right underneath all the stream team links and the links to my comic and whatever. I highly encourage you all, if you're interested in getting magic in any way at all, go and subscribe to this channel. His stuff is really well researched. It's really well edited. And he's genuinely charming. It is... Wonderful to just find a video like this that's just nice, refreshing, simple education. And so without further ado, let's go over his video. Pulling a rabbit from a hat. A trick that everybody knows and that hardly anyone actually performs. Who and when created it? Why did it become and why does it remain the synonym for magic? And what hidden meaning is there behind this illusion? My name is Alex Romanov. I'm a magician and a historian. Today I'm going to tell you the history and the real secret of pulling a rabbit from a hat trick. This episode is produced in partnership with Vanishing Inc. Let's start. If 
I ask you to think of a logo for magic as a performing art, an image that would represent magic, I am pretty sure that pulling a rabbit from a hat certainly would be one of the first things that comes to your mind. Fair enough, pulling a rabbit from a hat is the symbol of magic. Stock photos, cartoons, business cards, bags, t-shirts, it is everywhere. And here is a paradox. Most people have never seen this trick, and most magicians have never deformed it. And yet, for some reason... That's actually sadly true. It's very difficult to do a rabbit in a hat in this day's um, age. Um, you can thank PETA a lot for that. <laughs> the most caring and loving group of animal rights activists to have ever existed. But I, I am curious, uh, those of you who, outside of my show, because I just did one like a few minutes ago, uh, how many of you have ever seen a magician pull a rabbit from a hat outside of a, like, you know, cartoon or whatever? It, it's uh, not something you see very often. And I'm, I kind of hope to make it, hope that it makes a comeback because it's such a staple, it'd be a shame to lose it. Let's continue with this video. Reason everybody associates it with magic. As a magician, I can say nine out of ten people would, at some point in the conversation, inevitably make a reference to a rabbit in the hat trick. Sometimes they just ask if I can do it, and sometimes they try to make a hilarious joke about it, which is never actually funny. But I still laugh because I'm a nice guy. So I asked myself, how did it happen? When did this trick, which you never see performed during magic conventions, which you never learn as an aspiring magician, which you never find in modern books and magic, become so popular? So let's go back in time and find the answers. All right, part one, in 1949, a magazine for magicians, Genie, published an article How to Produce a Rabbit from a Borrowed Hat by William W. Larson, co-founder of the Hollywood Magic Castle. At the end of the article, he wrote, Did you know how all this rabbits from a hat business began? It seems that in England, hundreds of years ago, a woman claimed that she was attacked by a monster rabbit and later gave birth to five cute baby bunnies. A magician of the time, quick to cash in on the publicity attendant the matter, advertised the birth of a rabbit from a borrowed hat and did quite handsomely buy it. Wait, what? <laughs> this is a yeah, and that's the most charming, beautiful trick of magic. It's absolute staple. Started from this. <laughs> Oh, and this topic, this topic alone uh, has sent me through a metaphysical rabbit hole of some of the strangest uh, fact being stranger than fiction topics just from his channel alone and then doing my own independent research of all the weird history of magic and how it got started and where all this stuff comes from. Um, especially magicians, because they are such larger-than-life figures, so many of them. Um, and it has led me into topics of kidnapping, murder, <laughs> uh, theft, stolen identities, all sorts of craziness. And this is just the beginning, with this topic of a rabbit from a hat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it starts from a woman gives birth to blank headline. That's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, I believe he goes into it a little bit more, but I will, if not, I'll share just a bit more. Actually, a funny story. In 1729, a lady named Mary Toft gave oh, birth to 12 rabbits, which was confirmed by her husband and by a doctor. This story went all the way up and even reached His Majesty King George I. Yet, after having been brought under proper investigation, Mary confessed to a fraud. So this part of the story really happened. But there is no evidence of any performers of the time who used it to attract public attention. Yeah, the story of Mary Toff, uh, the woman who gave birth to the live rabbits, it's such a weird story. 
uh, my own little independent dive into it has brought up multiple conflicting accounts. Then again, it is from like, what was it, 1770-something, uh, where it's like she gave birth to a bunch of dead animals and she was caught trying to sneak rabbits into her room for the birth thing to prove it and all sorts of just craziness. But it didn't make it all the way up to the king. That's something that all my research has proven, <laughs> has agreed on. And her name was Mary Toff, and it was definitely one of those weird, strange things. It's, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautifully chaotic. <laughs> so this part is only a legend. We do not know about any magicians pulling rabbits from hats until the 19th century. It is believed that this historical world-changing event first happened only 85 years after the story of Mary Toft. In 1840... In 85 years later, we finally pull a rabbit from a hat. <laughs> oh, it's such a weird, weird set of coincidences in all the story. Didn't expect it to go this way, did you? No, you didn't. Teen, a popular French magician, Louis Comte, also known as the King's Conjurer, pulled a rabbit from a hat during his show for the first time in history. Maybe even in front of the French king Louis XVIII. About 20 <laughs> years later, in 1836, a book, The Humorous Magician Unmasked, was published. In this book, among other tricks such as to make a person disappear in a sack, we find the first detailed descriptions of the rabbit trick. The trick is called experiment number 36, to produce a live rabbit and a number of other articles from a gentleman hat. And it looked like this. A magician borrows a gentleman's hat and put it on his table. He then produces a live rabbit, a small dog, kitten, potatoes, a cabbage, <laughs> apples, and a number of other vegetables and fruits. Uh, and off he goes. It's just not, just not, not just rabbits, but we're pulling dogs and cats, potatoes, lettuces, deck of cards, uh, all sorts of crazy things from rats. It's wonderful. And this is obviously where the uh, the idea for another trick that will be covered at some point called the circle square came from as well. At least from my own independent studies have shown. Uh, it, <laughs> it's just the silliness of what they would do for magic back in those days and what you could just get away with just because people were, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't say stupid they, because they weren't. People just weren't stupid. They just didn't know things. <laughs> or they just didn't think about it. Or they were just so willing to be charmed. It, it's beautiful. Cannonballs of various sizes, also a wig, and anything else that will amuse. <laughs> the secret of the trick is simple and practical. You need an assistant hidden in the table that will put all these amusing objects inside the hat. Yeah, yeah just put uh, somebody under the table the whole time. That's literally all it is. <laughs> uh, how unsophisticated magic was back in those days. Just just put somebody on their table, it'll be fine. <laughs> Either from this book or from Louis Comte, this trick was adopted by a magician, John Henry Anderson. John Henry Anderson came from Scotland and was known as the Great Wizard of the North and claimed that he was given this title by the famous Scottish writer Walter Scott. It was not true. In fact, a lot of what Anderson claimed was not true. But one thing we know for sure, Anderson used the rabbit trick in his repertoire in the late 1830s. And I have proof. Here, my dear friends, is the first picture in history of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. History. History in the making right there. First ever picture of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat. <laughs> Not what you were expecting, was it? Uh, Anderson is an interesting figure. He's definitely going to get his own uh, episode one day. And I'm, I'm just looking around. He's got like one, two, three, four, four rabbits, it looks like. Uh, five, six, seven in the hat. 
and he's just surrounded by all these different crazy props because magicians would literally just have all of their props sitting around them right before the show. It's, the sophistication wasn't quite there. <laughs> John Henry Anderson was famous for his incredible marketing. He even carried a printing press with him during his travels so he could print flyers, posters, and booklets on the go. So he definitely helped to popularize the trick. This illusion was soon copied by his colleagues. For example, by his rival, the Great Wizard of the South. And if it starts to sound like an epic fantasy film to you with all these wizards, it is okay because 19th century magic was really epic. In 1876, Angela John Lewis, the leading writer on magic of the time, published a book, Modern Magic, under a pseudonym Professor Hoffman. In that book, the rabbit trick looked like this. A magician borrows a hat from a spectator, produces an egg from it, and then two live rabbits. Then one of the rabbits apparently swallows the other one, and to prove it, the performer draws special attention to the imaginary increased fatness of the remaining rabbit. The second rabbit then reappears alive and well. This book would become the main magic manual for a whole genius. <laughs> Just listening to that description, it reminds me of uh, whenever you buy a magic tricks from like a marketer or a shop or whatever, and you're, you gotta be careful when you're buying the cheap stuff. The obviously made in China, very small print leaflet magic. Because uh, it literally will just describe a trick like that, and that's all you're going to get in here. <laughs> you're going to have to fool around with it in order to figure it out. And the routines it gives you is going to be stupid or doesn't make any sense or it doesn't sound natural in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> of magicians around the world, so it for sure promoted the rabbit trick among performers. In the late 19th century, many famous magicians performed this feat. But there was one magician who did something really special to popularize it. All right, and into the golden age of the rabbit. English conjurer David Devant became the first performer to be there ever is. captured on film. And in this short film, he produced rabbits from a hat, even though it was done using camera tricks. Devant also complained that sometimes he performed this trick at children's parties and kids could steal <laughs> rabbits from him, so he had to chase them around the house to get his rabbits back. Yeah, this doesn't sound like an epic fantasy film anymore. Alexander. Uh, so yeah, there he is, David Devant, the first magician to ever be caught on film. Uh, did rabbits from a hat using a bit of camera trickery. This is back before uh, the sophistication of film editing was at its highest, so that was actually really impressive. Uh, this is, So this was back before... Um, it's one of the earliest things ever recorded on camera, if I'm remembering this correctly. Uh, David Devant... Um, uh, pioneered a lot of the early modern, early camera editing stuff that was used way back when it first started. And that's why he's going to get his own video because he's basically one of the first movie directors. <laughs> a magician started all of this. Just think about what I'm sitting here on right now, streaming live video to you guys. And it got started with film and camera reels and simple literally having to go in with a pair of scissors to slice film together we've come a long way since then the herman aka herman the great had rabbits featured in his acts regularly american superstar magician howard thurston later produced all out of a hat including his pretty assistants and rabbits Thurston was also generous enough to give rabbits as presents to his young spectators. With so many stars of magic performing this trick, it is no surprise that it soon became a cliché. In 1924, magician Carl Hertz, in his book A Modern Mystery Merchant, wrote, 
borrow a gentleman's silk hat and instead of producing a rabbit or a guinea pig therefrom, just try to throw in a pack of cards from a distance of two or three feet. You will provide the entertainment just the same, but as card after card falls anywhere but in the hat, you will discover that the audience provides the entertainment at your expense. So it is clear that in 1924 this trick was such a cliché that Hertz believed that doing this could be as entertaining as producing a rabbit. In 1920s... Yeah, it became a cliché that fast. That's how powerful this one little simple trick is. And it is a staple for, of magic. It is the staple of magic for a reason. And we'll be getting into that just a little bit more. Six. Dr. Harlan Tarbell published his famous course in magic. It would become and still remains one of the most well-known sources of magic secrets. Tarbell described a bunch of rabbit tricks and it is even pictured on the cover of the first volume of the course. About this time... Uh, so Tarbell, this magician he's talking about here, as well as Thurston and Herman, which you talked about just briefly before, all three of these guys are going to get in an episode for sure. Uh, but Tarbell's Course in Magic. If you're an aspiring magician, pick this up. Pick it up. Pick up all the volumes. I believe there's about eight of them. And that's all you're going to need to get started. It'll teach you everything. Everything. Tarbell put everything he could into those books. I'm pulling rabbits from a hat started to become a part of popular culture and being used as a metaphor for something magical. Here are some cool examples. In 1932, <laughs> it was used for the advertisement of Electrolux vacuum cleaners. The celerity with which a conjurer produces a rabbit from a hat is no more wonderful than the ease and rapidity with which the Electrolux makes dust disappear. <laughs> In 1940, for Carter Furware. How breathlessly we used to in 1940, Turlux makes dust disappear. Incredible until you know how it's done. <laughs> Marketing at its finest. <laughs> in 1940, for Carter Furware. How breathlessly we used to watch rabbits being brought out of an empty silk hat. But there is another magic, no less entrancing, because it is done quietly and simply. The undeniable magic of Carter restyling. That's marketing at its best. In 1942, <laughs> this trick was featured in a story about one of the most famous rabbits, Bugs Bunny. The, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat. Regardez! <laughs> Yay. How do you do it? <laughs> People who created these ads and cartoons in 1930s and 1940s were in their 20s, 30s or 40s. So it is very probable that they had experienced magic shows as kids and they had inevitably seen this trick performed by Thurston or Herman or Devant. So for them, it was indeed the symbol of magic. But not for magicians, because ironically, starting from the 1930s, 1940s, there were fewer and fewer magicians who actually performed it. And now we're going to his downfall. The unfortunate downfall is such a beautiful trick. In 1955, in a magazine for magicians, Abracadabra, the author wrote, Every layman likes a conjurer to be able to produce a rabbit from a hat. He then complained, it is a feat of which many magicians are shy, largely on account of the difficulty of loading the animal into the hat. And this is right, the trick got less and less practical. Top hats went out of fashion and rabbits got fatter. Well, not really, of course, but the top hats did go out of fashion. Plus, true. a lot of magicians were performing in nightclubs, not in theaters or switch to close-up magic, so carrying a rabbit around was not convenient. 
Besides, doing tricks with the live animals became an ethical question. Does a rabbit really want to sit in a secret pocket for 15 minutes before it has to appear on a stage with hundreds of loud people around it? Well, I'm not sure, to be honest. In 1964, the article in... All right. Now, so the whole uh, debate about whether it's ethical to treat a rabbit like this, um, from what I've just seen of animals, they don't really seem to mind so long as they're loved. I mean, obviously, if you're going to get a rabbit for doing this trick, that's a pet. That's a big commitment. You don't treat it like you would any other prop. That That's a living thing. And people don't like seeing living things get hurt. Unless, you know, specific cases of like hunting and whatnot. On a stage, no, nobody wants to see a rabbit get hurt or be mistreated or abused. It's a it's a bunny. It's a bunny rabbit. All right, be nice to Hopper. Uh, not not Hopper, Thumper. <laughs> That's the name of the rabbit from Bandy. Um, as for um, top hats going out of style, yeah, unfortunately. And then people keep <laughs> I keep during the research for this, I keep seeing uh, articles and videos from about two, three years ago about whether or not top hats are going to make a comeback. <laughs> but I don't know. I think dressing nicer should make a comeback. I really do. Some people really need some major fashion tips. <laughs> I, myself included. Let's just put my name at the top of the list there. Well... I'm not sure, to be honest. In 1964, the article in another magazine for magicians, The Linking Ring, claimed, I bet 99 out of every 100 magicians do not even use live rabbits in their act, let alone produce them from a hat. It was true, in the second half of the 20th century, there was no star magician who used it as his trademark trick, like it was 50 years earlier. Today, That's many true. magicians still do tricks with rabbits, but very few actually produce them from hats. Even in this video from the insider dedicated to pulling a rabbit from a hat trick, which is actually a really nice video, they did not pull a real rabbit from a hat and instead showed the production of a fake rabbit and a rabbit vanish using a box. So now, when we know the history of the trick, let's get back to the really interesting question. Considering the fact that the trick is hardly ever performed today, what is the secret of its popularity in public imagination? First and foremost, as I already said, it was promoted by many famous magicians of the Golden Age of Magic, late 19th, early 20th century, and it was at that time that it entered popular culture. But why this trick in particular? There were. All right, so let's expand upon the question. I'm very curious what you, my audience, think. Why do you think this trick uh, became so popular from magicians? Uh, in the meantime, let's look at what your comments have been. <laughs> I have a brown leather top hat from the steampunk craze, so fingers crossed. Ooh, uh, is it a? You said it's a, a leather. Ooh, a leather top hat. That's a, that's probably real nice, actually. I like top hats. I'm think I'm trying to get a hold of one, an actual really nice silk top hat to use in my own performances. Uh, whether I'm performing as Smoke, the uh, the character, same character from the comics, um, that's more of my um, family friendly audience, or as Doctor Crow, the internet persona that I that you guys know me as, um, uh, which is more kind of like got that little bit of a. Uh, gothic edge to it because it's the whole plague doctor outfit i forgot my train of thought of what was going for this because i read gemini here uh gemini says because bunnies are cute and do well with women and children absolutely that's <laughs> that's probably exactly why everybody everybody likes seeing a bunny don't they they love seeing a bunny <laughs> they get a real kick out of it many other cool tricks with elephants or birds or guinea pigs? Well, the right couple of reasons. First, let us talk about the rabbit. Rabbits could be easily obtained in any town on any market, so it was just practical. If you were a traveling magician, you could get a rabbit right before your show. 
Rabbits can also sit quietly for long periods of time, unlike, for example, cats or dogs. Rabbits have white fur and it creates a nice contrast with a black hat and a suit. Plus, rabbits can appear bigger than they actually are. They are kind of squishy, like spongebobs. It is just a metaphor. Never squish a rabbit like a spongebob. And of course, rabbits are very, 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 very cute. Very cute. Okay, now top hats. Uh, top. All right, so he went over. Yep, uh, Blue got it right. Um, also the black hat and white rabbit. From a design standpoint, two simple symbols with high contrast are great for visual advertisements. Absolutely. <clears throat> It is uh, just the simple white on black. It makes it easy for the rabbit to see. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Stanton. Hi, it's good to see you. Uh, fun fact, Jim and I is a do. Yeah, we, we are very much aware. <laughs> ah, I hope you, hope you enjoy. Pets were simply a standard element of a gentleman's outfit in the 19th and early 20th century, which was practical and important because very often a magician borrowed a hat from a spectator, which made this trick much more impressive. But I must say that magicians did many different tricks with the rabbits that did not involve hats, and also many tricks with hats that did not involve rabbits. So for some reason it was not producing a rabbit from under a spectator's coat or producing a cabbage from a top hat that became popular. It was the combination of these two particular elements that created a truly memorable image. So memorable that it is still relevant today. And there is a reason for this. It is a combination of something serious associated with culture, social status, good manners on the one hand, and on the other hand, something completely opposite. A funny, cute little creature. It is this contrast that makes this trick funny, exciting, and easy to remember. And most importantly, it is universal. It works for everyone. Imagine the most serious gentleman, a senator or a president, wearing a top hat. A magician borrows a hat, Everybody feels tension. What is he going to do? It is a respected gentleman and it is an expensive, high quality top hat. Now, if you produce a cabbage, it would just be weird. But if you produce <laughs> a rabbit, everybody will be laughing and smiling. The tension is released and there is an adorable rabbit in the room. So even the most serious gentleman would smile. And this is what magic essentially is about taking serious, smart adults and allowing them to experience wonder just like kids. And pulling a rabbit from a hat is a perfect representation of this idea. And yeah, that's exactly what magic does. We, uh, our goal is to mystify and entertain. Uh, Staten High, uh, sorry, Carl, I distract. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, and speaking of distractions, I have a guest in the back room. So, let's get our intro for him here. Hello, Space Oyster. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm a little laggy, so it might be difficult for me to commentate and banter, but I am here. It's awesome to have you on. We've uh, been covering the history of the rabbit from a hat trick. Oh, I know nothing about that trick. All right. So we're going to give you the quick and dirty version. All right. All right. So the according to the myth is that a magician got the idea way back in the 1700s after a woman claimed she gave birth to 15 live rabbits. <laughs> yeah, that's how this... Weirdness is bound. Oh, that that sounds that is funny. <laughs> uh, the first known performance performance was for the Emperor of France, uh, whose name I cannot remember right now for the life of me. Uh, where he produced uh, a rabbit, a dog, a cat, potatoes, a cabbage, and a whole bunch of different uh, cannibals of varying in sizes, and ending with a full grown woman. 
<laughs> this version of the trick was done by a hole in the hat and a hole in the table. <laughs> uh, not very sophisticated, but okay. All right. So I think I'm all cut up, caught up. But, uh -huh. but does the rabbit really live in the hat? Like, does he have a house mm -hmm. there? I bet he has a house there. Not a house, his apartment. He's got to pay rent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, otherwise, a big note is just that the rise of this particular trick was very famous with magicians throughout the Golden Age of Magic, which was about the 1920s, the, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, so much so that when the first magic trick ever performed by the Vaunt uh, was him pulling rabbits out of a hat. <laughs> uh, otherwise, we've just gone through why the philosophy behind why this works out well, which our video here believes it's because of the serious nature of the top hat being the gentleman's hat and the cute, fluffy nature of a rabbit, <laughs> as well as, you know, the uh, being white and mo magicians mostly wearing black with a, behind a black background. <laughs> and otherwise, we're just on go briefly over the future of rabbits in magic. There are some great modern acts with rabbits by such performers as Penn and Teller or Paul Daniels, and I highly recommend watching them. Yet all of them play on the same idea. Pulling a rabbit from a hat is a stereotype, and magicians rarely do it. So today this trick is a paradox. Magicians do it only because they are supposed to. Will it remain the symbol of magic in the next 100 years? We do not know. Do something unexpected but ingeniously effective in response to a problem. This is what an idiom pulling a rabbit from a hat means. So one thing we can say for sure, even if soon rabbits retire from stage career completely and top hats will be only seen in museums, magicians will continue finding unexpected and ingeniously effective solutions to their main problem. How to make sure that spectators are astonished. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then don't forget to press the like button. All right, and that is uh, Pulling a Rabbit Out of the Hat, the secret history and meaning of the most famous magic trick. Uh, once again, this channel is uh, Art of Impossible. I highly, 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 just absolutely highly recommend subscribing to this channel. He does really good work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Why don't I see a subscriber not numbers going up already yeah he's only at two thousand just over two thousand subs that's a that is a shame yeah it's like, sometimes um, more than i got <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and of course you can go subscribe to space oyster his link is in the description too <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. so yeah before we move on to actually revealing how the trick is done this will give a moment for anybody who doesn't want to know and just wanted to know the history of the magic uh, Wait. Step away. I, I thought I thought it was against the magician's code to reveal the trick. Don't well, doesn't that get you disqualified as a magician or something? Now here's the thing about the magician's code. <laughs> They're more like guidelines. I immediately noticed my numbers on the stream shot up the moment I said we're going to reveal the trick. <laughs> uh, YouTube algorithm at work there. So like I was saying giving a moment for anybody who doesn't want to see how the rabbit from a hat trick can be performed in the modern day. Uh, giving you guys a moment to step out. Any questions about the history of a rabbit from a hat? Any from you, Space Oyster? Um, yes. Why did they use a rabbit specifically? Is it just because it's unexpected? Uh, rabbit is used specifically because of their, they are what's known as a compressible animal which means they're larger than they actually are. Most of their body mass is usually scrunched up. If you think about the posture of a rabbit with it's kind of like hunched over and everything. So they, oh. they fit very well into small spaces, like a top hat. Oh, okay. Uh, third, second reason is that rabbits are mostly white. Most rabbits available to the public at the time were just white rabbits. And that stands out really well against the magician's typically black clothing and back 
black background that they performed in front of. Hmm. And the third oh. reason is that rabbits are were or at least were very very cheap. <laughs> Every market back in the uh, in the 1900s and before sold rabbits as livestock, not necessarily as pets. Ooh. So uh, rabbits were very easy to get a hold of. These three things make it very practical for magicians to perform with rabbits, as well as rabbits' a natural ability to be very docile, unlike a cat or a small dog. Uh, they'll okay. sit still. They won't make a lot of noises. They're not going to run about at random. Anybody who know, owns a cat knows about how they'll just take off at the slightest instance. Yeah, yeah <laughs> cats do not give a fuck. No, are, we, are we allowed to swear? Yeah, swearing is fine. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any questions from the chat, either that or they haven't loaded in yet, which I'm, it's probably very likely. <laughs> Just make sure. Yeah. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, we will go into our next video, which we are going to reveal at long last how Rabbit is pulled from a hat. have here uh how to pull a rabbit out of a hat there we go so a lot of you probably know about this magician he is known as the masked magician of all the videos i'm showing this is one of the two that have me a little bit worried about getting a copyright strike <laughs> now for one of magic's most basic tricks pulling a rabbit out of a hat nothing up his sleeve Anna. the hat is empty There it goes. Uh, so you see him messing with the hat here. Let's try to get that quality up a little bit higher. Doing some quick technical uh, uh, technical uh, processes here. Technical technical difficulties. Please stand by. Yeah. Uh. Whenever I tried to stream, that would happen happen so often. I'd have yeah. to. I just have to. Have it it ready to go. He tosses it into the air to show you that the rabbit isn't hidden inside. He yeah. unfolds the red scarf. This is merely a diversion. Watch closely. He reaches into his hat and presto, little white bunny. I really wanted to make this comment um, about this show, the narrator, and it more so than the magician revealing how the tricks are done. The narrator is commentary over it annoys me the most. <laughs> he's always just like acting like he's so much better than everyone else. Well, of course he is. He's a magician. Yeah. All right. So let's see how it's done. Here's how it's done. First, a very small rabbit is carefully placed inside a specially designed black handkerchief. Don't worry, the rabbit is perfectly comfortable. There's in no danger of being harmed. The handkerchief is then hung behind the magician's table. If you're wondering, the reason why magicians work with rabbits instead of cats or other small animals is that rabbits naturally sit still. Yeah. When the magician yeah. picks up the hat, he also picks up the rabbit and puts it inside. Take another look in slow motion. The hat goes up, and in goes the rabbit. Just like that, rabbit's in the hat. Now watch again and see if you can spot when the rabbit is put inside the hat. Right there. Did you see it? The magician reaches inside the concealed handkerchief and releases the rabbit. And there you have it. And there he is. Cute little bunny. Uh, hey. Now, I, uh, before we click away from this video about how the trick is done, I'm going to go over uh, a couple of things that the magician is doing that the narrator does not. So I'm going to turn off the narrator. Because the guy narrating this, I believe, is actually a different guy than the magician himself. Uh, so, yeah, 
I don't think I have the mental fortitude to be a magician. Uh, if, while I'm doing a trick, I'd always be worrying, oh, God, they can see it. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that's a concept called flashing, uh, where the audience sees something they're not supposed to see. Uh, you flash the trick to them, essentially. Uh, and it's definitely a, an absolute worry for any magician. So what he's doing right now uh, with the... Of course, the classic nothing up my sleeves is a technique called proving. He's essentially just proving to the uh, audience that there's no uh, nothing up his sleeve. It's very just as simple as that. Uh, that's not magic. That's just a dude putting a rabbit in a hat. I was like to my whole life. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Staten High. Well, it's still magic because where did the rabbit come from? Uh, well, you see, when a mommy rabbit and a daddy rabbit love each other very much. <laughs> oh, oh, a mommy and a daddy rabbit. I see how it is. Well, that, it's an important part of biology. <laughs> very right. important. Never ignore biology. So he is showing in this uh, simple act of just having the red scarf in the hat that the hat is empty. More proving. Uh, just the flip in the hat, that's called a flourish. Uh, just doing something fancy that doesn't affect the magic at all and what, so anyway, it's just an eye catcher for the audience. Uh, it sets the hat off to the side, showing off that there's nothing special about the red handkerchief and puts it down. Yeah. And so, this is the end of his uh, whole proving routine, just showing that there is no funny business going on whatsoever. And while he's distracting you with the red handkerchief, if you notice with his hand on the red handkerchief, he's moving that back and forth at the same time he's grabbing the hat. Yeah, so the red handkerchief, it's like a red herring. Yes, uh, literally. Uh, this the act of him moving his hand across the, uh, the red handkerchief and showing all that off is the classic misdirection. Uh, you're pulling the audience's eyes somewhere else away from what you're actually doing. Uh, so here we have, he just flipped the hat up, pulled it up. And now at this point, we know the rabbit is in there because we saw how this ends. What he's doing specifically with the hat is called blocking. I'll let you guess what that means. He's blocking visual sight of the handkerchief that's holding the rabbit from the hat. The handkerchief is, of course, small enough to fit in the bottom of the hat where we can't see into the hat. We just see him reach in and pull out our beautiful little bunny. As you can see, we can't see, we can't actually see into the hat. And even if we could, the handkerchief itself is black. So he reaches in, he's unclasping the handkerchief, just opening it up, and there's our bunny. All, all fine. Yeah. And not to mention pulling the bunny out of the handkerchief makes it seem like he's also reaching deeper into the hat or the, deeper absolutely. into the deeper into the space inside of the hat, because those things are just bottomless. Oh, yeah. Uh, without and, it, and also does it without him having to shove his hand all the way into the hat itself, so that way it doesn't look like he's just sticking it into like a secret compartment um, in the table. So his hands are way up, So, but it looks like he's reaching deep into the hat. And that, that's really all it is. It's a beautiful baby bunny. Yay. Yay. All right. So, uh, before we continue on uh, to the next section of the stream, which is the proper care and maintenance of the props. Um, yeah. Obviously, we're going to be going into the care. We're going to cover a quick video on the do's and don'ts of rabbits. Uh, so this is just giving you your most basic surface level of rabbit understanding. There's a lot more that goes into it than what I'm about to show you. Yeah. Well, uh, so well, first, make sure you. Yeah, the first thing to always remember about bunnies is that they're pure evil. Evil, I tell you. Evil, evil with sharp, vicious teeth. <laughs> It's got a horrible de a horrendous look at the bones. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. That movie's fantastic. 
Yeah, it's a shame I've only seen it once. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously, quick disclaimer, if you haven't thought about it before, don't just go out and buy a rabbit in a top hat thinking you can just do this trick whenever. You're buying a living creature that expects you to care for it and feed it and love it because it is a bunny and it deserves all the little loving. It looks how cute it is. <laughs> yeah, if you've seen Arrested Development, you know what can happen if you don't take good care of the pigeons you shove up your jacket. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably do doves at some point as well. This this also applies to doves and any other type of livestock you're using, including fish. <laughs> um, if you do anything with fish like I do in my performances, I always buy feeder fish. I don't I try not to use uh betas and goldfish anymore ever since I've proven that I can't properly take care of them. I, I keep killing my betas. I feel so bad. <laughs> Every time one of them dies, it's like, no. Well, you don't so, need yeah. to worry too much. They were just betas. They're not the alphas. Yes. <laughs> Beta males or females. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I prefer to use feeder fish because those are the fish that otherwise they're just going to be fed to something that's going to eat them. <laughs> All right. So here we go for rabbits. Prancing to microchipping, rabbit care really has come Oh, along. right. Uh, so this is a video of the rabbit's do's and don'ts by uh, Linen the Bunny. As always, links are down in the description below. So that way you can watch these videos on your own time if you need them for a quick reference. Bunny care is very important. Years. Bunny care is and very important. developments are always arising on how to keep those, ah, come those on. buns of steel. Pun intended, or should I say, bun intended? Seeing as how we've just entered a new decade, let's take a look at the big do's and don'ts of rabbit hair of today. Yeah, we're going to skip the intro a little bit. Today's video you and sponsor like phone as well. And I have her hay and Roomba anti collision yeah. has self. Eh, it's a nice change of pace to see somebody who's sponsored by something that isn't Raid Shadow Legends or, <laughs> or Raycon earbuds. Uh, yes, Blue actually brings up a very good point. Pet shops lie about how to take care of betas and make them seem easier to take care of than, the, than they are um, and sell more of them. So you're far from the only one not able to keep them alive. That's actually true for a lot of pet shops. Yeah. Um, Nothing personal against the employees there because oftentimes they're just a teenager trying to, you know, get a job. Well, they work in customer service. They probably just want to die inside. Service. It's nothing personal against them. A lot of them do really love animals, but a lot of them also probably only had a dog or a cat, maybe a fish or two, if at all. Some pet shops don't require you to have pet prior pet knowledge before you work for them. <laughs> so do your own research. Seriously, before you buy any pet, just do your research. Look into it. And as always, always go for adoption. I, I'm a big proponent of adopting, but I also don't shame. There's also like this weird thing about shaming people who buy pets. And it's like, I don't, it's not like the pet had a choice. Come on, people. <laughs> I don't shame people who buy pets. It's, that's ridiculous, too. Yeah, just moral of the story, take care of your pets. Take care of your pets. Love your pet, and they will love you. Mm -hmm. Free charging and resumption, and the added 25 in the description. Do's and don'ts of rabbit care. Here we go. Don't feed your rabbits lots of sweets. Guys, I know this one's hard. That little puppy face they give you is just irresistible. And quite frankly, when Lennon begs, it's very manipulative. It just makes me want to give her an entire box of Cheerios. But we must remember that rabbit bellies are so fragile and too much sugar or anything outside of their normal high fiber diet can send them into GI stasis. And trust me, you don't want your rabbit to go into GI stasis. If you don't know what GI stasis is, I'll link the video in the iCard above. Do give your... All right. First two steps here is both feed your bunny properly. Yeah. You don't want to be dealing with a poopy rabbit on stage. 
Yeah. You know, it sounds like they just split this into two different points so they could pad their video. Got to hit that 10 minute runtime. Yeah, probably. But I mean, um, why is just like very obviously everybody wants to feed their rabbits fruit. And another thing I want to point out just about rabbits, I don't think they go into in this video. Rabbits can't really eat carrots. Oh, yeah, isn't that like some sort of misconception? Like at a, That's a, it's some sort of misconception. Uh, they will eat them, but they can't. It's like, it's like just living on like candy bars for us. It's not very good for them. Uh, rabbits are very, very difficult to take care of, actually, as pets. <laughs> Wait, so you mean Bugs Bunny was lying to me? I never should have trusted that cartoon rabbit. Probably, probably was lying to you. Who would have known a talking rabbit lied to you? Who could have seen it coming? Bunnies, unlimited grass hay, leafy green veggies according to their weight, and yes, reward your bunny once or twice a day with a healthy goodie such as a small bite of fruit to remind them just how gorgeous they are. Everyone deserves a little sweetness every now and then. Don't trance your bunnies. This is a big no-no. Trancing is the action of placing a rabbit on its back to induce a paralysis. Sometimes people think that a cradling motion is comforting to rabbits, but guys, just a little reminder, they're not human babies. This is a very stressful position for the rabbit to be in and is a defense mechanism for when the rabbit feels it's been caught by a predator. Even scientific studies have shown that rabbit heart rates increase dramatically when being tranced. In that, that particular... Um bit of advice very important for magicians please don't do this to your rabbits <laughs> all right yeah. and for general pet owners i heard cats and dogs hate it too yeah cats not so much um dogs hate it oh they hate it they do not want to be on their backs because that's an exposed belly uh if an animal exposes its belly to you that is like the most ultimate sign of trust because they're not afraid of you and they kind of want you to rub their tummy. <laughs> well, every time I go to rub my cat's tummy, she attacks me. It's a trap. Yes, it's a trap. My cat does that too. <laughs> but it's just them showing affection. Uh, but yeah, I know with the trancing, I've heard the stories of magicians who would trance their rabbits um, for, you know, tricks like this. Not just from like rabbit from a hat or like any sort of bunny box routine. Uh, which is a whole like subcategory of different tricks that um, boxes boxes would do with rabbits. Um, they would put them into a trance so that way they would sit even stiller. And it's like rabbits will already stay in their little confined space just fine. As long as you don't keep them in there for too long, they're not going to care. <laughs> right. Do give your bunny head rubs, ear massages, nose nudges, belly rubs, snuggles, and the list goes on to show them that you love them. It's pretty simple, really. Don't bathe your bunny. It's totally un- All right, so love your rabbit. Obviously, you want to take, you want to show your rabbit love and affection. And for us magicians, that's very important because when we show them all that love and affection outside of performing, it's going to allow them to trust us more when we do shove them into the into uh, tight little spaces <laughs> hang them from handkerchiefs they're going to trust that we have uh, that we're going to love them and that they're going to be just fine necessary and can potentially kill yes kill your rabbit rabbits have very thin skin and very dense coats it takes twice the time for a rabbit's coat to dry than it does most dogs this can cause your rabbit's temperature to drop almost immediately sending them into hypothermia Furthermore, submerging a rabbit in water can also send them into shock, which is worse than hypothermia because often the bunny will not recover from such trauma. Do let your bunny clean themselves naturally. They're kind of yeah, germaphobes. I knew baths were evil. Light cats yeah. will groom themselves on the daily to make sure that they're staying fresh at all times. If your rabbit gets dirty for whatever reason, you can use a damp cloth or pet safe wipes on any soiled areas. Don't buy a small cage. Cages are a cruel practice of the past. They can cause depression, aggression, obesity, odors, sores on the bottoms of the paws, and the list goes on. Yeah. Do give your bunny free range of a room or your house if possible, but sometimes an exercise pen can suit them as well if big enough. 
So this is very important stuff to us. To don't buy rabbits' cages. Seriously, do not leave your rabbit in that cage for too long. All right. Understand, magicians have to travel and stuff, so we put our rabbits in the kennels and whatnot, but we want to make sure the rabbit has plenty of space to move around when we finally let them outside of the kennel. All right, so a rabbit is not a great uh, animal to bring with you on a trip very far away. All right, unless you're like one of these magicians who are rich enough to own an RV <laughs> where the rabbit can wander about uh, free, free will and stuff as long as it doesn't get outside. Yeah, you know, just proper care. Think about how you travel with your animals. All right, you want to make sure they have plenty of space and plenty of time to roam about. Don't buy a rabbit for children. Yes, sometimes parents will buy bunnies for their children thinking it will teach them responsibility or to avoid having to get a bigger animal like a dog. But most children really can't comprehend the amount of work that goes into taking care of an animal, especially a high maintenance one like a rabbit. Sometimes if the child is even too young, they have trouble discerning when to be gentle with bunnies. And if the child is on the older side, you really have to think about what their future plans are. College, a job, moving out, and what predicament this puts your rabbit's life in. Do yeah. acquire a bunny when you feel financially ready, mature, responsible, and live in a place that allows you to have an animal in the home. Yeah. Don't pick up your bunnies by the scruff. It's just kind of rude and painful for the bunny, and considering these little guys are prey animals, picking them up the same way a hawk would, yeah, not cool and an easy way to send them into shock. Do pick them up by their hindquarters with one hand while supporting their midsection with the other. It's important to remember bunnies don't really like being picked up, but whenever it is necessary to do so, this is definitely the best way to make them most comfortable. Don't leave your rabbit alone for an extended period of time. Rabbits are social creatures that require... Uh, so, specifically about the handling of the rabbit, because that's you know an important bit for magicians. Oh, yeah, because uh, the magician does have to pick up the rabbit. Yep. Yeah. Make sure you hold the rabbit firmly. Don't squeeze it, uh, but hold it firmly in both hands. Preferably one hand on its rib cage, one hand on its bum. <laughs> that way, and don't hold it up for too long. Hold it up, go, oh, rabbit, and then put it right back down on the table so that way you can uh, just chill. It's very unlikely the rabbit's going to try to run away unless you're incredibly abusive to the rabbit. <laughs> or um, it's a feral rabbit. Oh, yeah. Don't don't perform with a feral rabbit. <laughs> And before you actually, here's a, just a special tip from me. Um, obviously, this is not a rabbit, performing rabbit uh, video, but uh, don't perform with your rabbit the day you get it. All right. Maybe spend a little bit of time having the rabbit backstage during shows so that way you can get used to a crowd. Or if you like perform for kids and you're able to, uh, don't, don't just start pulling out in front of kids because kids are very, very, very loud. Anybody who's had more than one little sibling will know. What? You're saying it's a bad idea to throw a new pet into a strange situation? Gasp, I say. Yeah, especially a timid animal like a rabbit and a bunch of rowdy, loud kids <laughs> who are hopped up on sugar and at the arcade. <laughs> right? <laughs> kids are almost as evil as rabbits. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a practice on proper crowd control. Um, you know. Um, so, if, like, obviously, if you're performing for a kid's birthday party and you do this trick, which I do not suggest doing livestock tricks for a kid's birthday party. It's just full stop. None of that. It's the same thing of, like, doing fire tricks for a kid's birthday party. No, it's just too dangerous for both the kids and the animal. But if you do, because I've seen magicians... Do so. Learn how to control a group of kids properly before you do it. All right, because the kids are going to want to pet the bunny. <laughs> uh, so you're going to have to be like, all right, one at a time. You come up here, just pet them along the back. Okay, you're done. Next person, come up and, you know, make sure the kids' hands are clean because, you know, kids get into stuff. <laughs> and perform for an adult's birthday party if you can instead. They're going to want a different type of rabbit. 
for interaction and affection. Although they do sleep during the day, they can't really fend for themselves like cats and do need to be monitored closely during their active hours. So yeah, that weekend trip, you'll have to get a bunny sitter for that. Do spend lots of time with your bunny and check up on them regularly to make sure they're not sick, malnourished, or dehydrated. Many people will also bond two or more rabbits together to create a lasting companionship and prevent boredom. Yeah. And Don't to get more bunnies. bunnies. Get more to bunnies. This day, you'll see these things being sold for rabbits at pet stores, but don't be fooled. Bunnies are actually at risk of dehydration when using these. Furthermore, the BPA in the plastic isn't good for your bunnies or the environment, and bottles are much harder to clean than bowls. Do give your bunnies a nice big bowl of water where they can drink without any restrictions. A heavy bowl and a stand will prevent them from tipping it. Don't take your rabbit to just any vet. Rabbits are weirdly still considered exotic in many parts of the world. Thus, you can't just take your rabbit to any cat and dog vet around the corner. Rabbit medical care is often viewed as a very specialized practice. Yeah, this is a very weird one where rabbits are still considered exotic. In, even in certain places in the US, they're considered exotic animals. And I, I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, well, they're probably classified as exotic, so that way they can charge you more. Probably. It's typical, it, and this is true for, like, all animals um, that would be considered livestock. Rabbits, cows, horses, anything you eat or is a beast of burden is considered livestock. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, because they're not animals people just keep normally. Uh, Proton Stalker, it's good to see you. Good to see you. So yeah, take care of your rabbit. And most regular vets won't know what to do if you show up with a sick rabbit. Do search for a rabbit savvy vet in your area that is reputable, has good reviews, regularly sees rabbits, or works with local rabbit rescues. Having this prepared ahead of an emergency will save you lots of time, money, and potentially your rabbit's life. Don't house your rabbits outside. Rabbits have a history of being housed outside because they were bred as meat. Not to mention the outdoors carry major risks such as predators like hawks, snakes, owls, foxes, raccoons, etc. These hungry predators can destroy a hutch within minutes or taunt your rabbits to the point of shock. Bunnies can also escape their enclosures and wind up lost or hit by a car. Let's not forget extreme weather, diseases, and poisonous I was about to say, don't show us that. <laughs> Do keep your bunnies indoors in a safe, bunny-proof environment where you can interact with them on a daily basis and give them lots of love. And finally, don't shop for rabbits, guys. Buying rabbits that are bred on purpose to produce profit only contributes to... Eh, I don't, I don't agree with this last point. It's like, obviously, you don't want to... You want to know where you're getting your rabbit from, so that way you're not getting an animal that's highly sick. That's just smart money management there, and of course... You don't want people who are going to be mean to animals trying to sell animals and keep keep that sort of practice going. Obviously, you just um, I'm curious to see what is a rabbit test, proton soccer. <laughs> I'm going to be interested to see what that answer is. Um, yeah, this is good advice for just keep taking care of pets in general. Yeah, definitely always take care of your pets, because if you don't, they won't take care of you. No, there's plenty of stories about dogs that turn on their owners or cats that eat their owners when they die. <laughs> it's just, uh, so yeah. The overpopulation and exploitation of rabbits and excludes the abundance of rabbits that are homeless. Do adopt your bunny from your local animal shelter, rabbit rescue, or humane society. There are so many bunnies that are dumped every single day and are looking for a forever home. Be the one who rescues. That's it for this video. I hope yeah. you enjoyed all the big. Right. So that was a uh, basics. Uh, the rabbit test for pregnancy, for people. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what he's going on about. Like. Test for see if a rabbit's pregnant. I, I don't know. All right, um, so then they need the bunny. 
uh, basic do's and don'ts of rabbits. For more in-depth detail about taking care of rabbits, you guys are going to have to find that on your own. I only have a limited amount of time, and we still got a lot to go over. A little bit more, actually. Not all, all much. Uh, because now we're going to start taking care of the second most important prop in this whole process. The, the hat. hat. <laughs> yeah. Yay, I got it right. The hat. Hats are very important. Although it makes me sad on Final Fantasy XIV, the race I like to play as can't wear hats. The cat people? Yeah, the cat people. Or, <laughs> I, like, I usually call them cat daddies. I mean, they don't let bunny ladies wear them either, and I assume bunny boys won't either. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, an old term, rabbits were used to test women for pregnancy. Ugh. Wait, um, how how do you use a rabbit to test a woman if a woman's pregnant? Do you like shove it up there and then it pulls out the thing, or? Ah, uh, I don't. Um, Blue Teddy, I gotta go. Have a lovely night, guys. So, bye, Blue. Uh, hopefully, you catch the rest of this afterwards because it's very important information. <laughs> There'll be a test on it later. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm yeah. just joking. Don't tell her there won't actually be a test. We're actually going to have a pizza party. You will, pizza. But first, you have to learn how to take care of your hat. Got to take care of your hat. So, while looking for videos on how to take care of hats, I found a channel called Gentleman's Gazette. And it's all about men's fashion. But, um, but what type, type of man, men's fashion? Because there um, there is actually a lot of variety to that. Fancy men's fashion, actual like proper get up, and it seems hey. like it's mostly focused around 1910s men fashion. Hey, uh, so things like uh, top hats, uh, newspaper boy ca caps, um, proper coats and pants, watches, all that certain stuff. The proper way to wear a fedora. <laughs> uh, well, I don't. I don't need to know about that. I'm a mollusk. Um, they had a video about taking care of hats and it was hats in general. And I was like, all right, this will be useful because it will get, they go over everything from like the type of material your hats made out of, like whether it's leather, silk, uh, another fabric, the different types of shapes for a hat. I was like, oh, that'd be great. So that way people can choose what type of hat they pull the rabbit out of. It's 25 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, takes, like, it takes 24 minutes to find the perfect hat to pull a bunny out of? No, it's just the proper care. Oh. Okay. They go so depth and so into detail about it. So I was like, uh, let's go a little bit something basic. Um, well, I mean, your bunny is going to have to live in that hat for at least a few seconds. Yeah. So this is the most basic uh, care for a silk top hat. This is for a silk top hat. If you want to do something with a different hat, it's best to go look for a um, that. I suggest that video from by the Gentleman's Gazette because they'll go much more into detail than this will. Oh God! If you want to know from a quick search, a chemical in a woman's <laughs> uh, would simulate a rabbit ovary, thus inducing pregnancy. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, I wish according, I didn't, I didn't According ask. to Wikipedia, it also works on mice. Yeah, all right. This very educational in ways I didn't want to know today. <laughs> all right. All right, how to care for your silk top hat. There's no talking in this video, so I shall read it. Use a soft brush to remove dust. Uh, come on, video. Come on, you can do it. Come on, Load. Your computer. Brush anti-clockwise. <laughs> Counterclockwise. Wait, was anti-clockwise a word term that was used? I mean, probably. I, uh, spray I'm... with water. Uh, wipe anti-clockwise with a velvet pad. But what if I want to wipe clockwise? Uh, what I if I think yeah? You'll mess up the silk because the silk has a grain to it. Oh, so silk doesn't like clocks. 
Yeah. Silk is uh, it's anti-time. All right. Silk lives backwards in history. Yeah. <laughs> Silk is chronophobic. <laughs> yes. Always place your hat brim down uh, to protect the silk. Wait, but then how are you going to pull a, ha a rabbit out of it? Uh, that's the only time you will turn your hat, um, I guess, top down. Yeah. So, yeah. They also don't go into it in this video, but always keep the hat box your hat comes in. So that way you have a nice place to store it to keep dust and other elements from getting on the hat. Uh, Proton Soccer actually brings it up, probably due to how they wind it. Yeah, you have to wind silk around um, what you're doing with it. Oh, so if you, could, okay. if you wound the uh, the the hat clockwise, you basically be undoing the hat. Mm. Yeah, and that's the basic guy for taking care of an antique silk top hat. Uh, that is very important knowledge any boy will need. Or girl. So, Hats don't discriminate. No, Blue has a leather top hat. So she's uh, good to go. She'll just need to look up how to take care of leather. Now, we know how to take care of the props. We know how to take care of the rabbit. We know how the trick is done. Are you ready for the test? The test? I didn't know there was supposed to be a test. Uh, how expensive are those? Those hats, uh, the cheapest ones I saw ranged to about $150 to $200. Silk top hats are not cheap. <laughs> Worth it, though. It's silk. Oh, yeah. That's why it's so expensive. Uh, so we are going to do some studying now. So back to the video I started, I started uh, this whole lecture off with. Uh, Paul Daniels' uh, version of the rabbit from a top hat. Ooh. Yep. So we are going to watch his uh, performance again. And we're going to go over and see where... He, and we're going to test your knowledge to see if you can tell where the rabbit is loaded. This has nothing to do with the trick. This is just union rules for magicians. <laughs> <laughs> or mimes. Yeah. Please, however, take note that there is nothing at all up this sleeve. Here we... <laughs> I'll start again. There's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. And as you can all... S you stand at this end of the table to do the trick. It's the only way. <laughs> and then you reach into the hat and you produce a rabbit. You keep hold of the hat. And then having kept hold of the hat, the magician would reach in and produce a rabbit. From a hat. There it is, the rabbit. That's not a rabbit, that's a hare. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the trick that has fooled millions. <laughs> it's for children, Mrs. All right, it's for children. Nobody said it was designed to fool an adult. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I can't find the rabbit, but I am a professional magician. I carry a spare. Ladies and gentlemen, the classic rabbit from a hat. I'm just going to pause real quick so that way we don't get copyright struck. Copyright bots are the worst evil on the world. Even worse uh, than rabbits. Even worse than rabbits. Rabbits aren't that bad. Except for that one. I think the pesky wabbit is trying to get away. 
I shall sneak up on the pesky wabbit. The moment we have all been waiting for. Especially me. Rabbit Maha! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. They see that's not supposed to be there at all. That's supposed to be on a hook right around, around the back of the table. You see that? <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> laughing you do not laugh you do not applaud until the magician produces a rabbit from a hat like that hello there he is now i stay a while here just to point something out because i know a lot of people love animals and worry don't worry about starsky we call him starsky he's got a hutch upstairs Aww. Aww. <laughs> it's adorable okay. every time. The hole in the hat is always bigger than he would tunnel in the ground, ladies and gentlemen. Always. Oh, he's always a sleepy bunny. Tunnel in the ground. And just in case you thought that was a fluke, this is his big trick. Go on, son. Out you pop. Yes, daddy loves you. And a lot of people pick up their animals by the ears. Never do that, children. That's dangerous. Come on, son. Get in the hat. Take a bow. Don't forget the box. That's the box. And off you go. Bye now. So, did you catch where he loaded the rabbit into the empty hat? Um, no, I think I, um, I think I might have missed it. But if I had to guess, was it when the uh, toy rabbit drove out of the box? Yes. So when the toy rabbit draw drove out of the box, that is misdirection. You, the audience eye is being pulled away from what Paul Daniels is doing <laughs> in the most clever way I've ever seen. <laughs> The rabbit making his obvious escape out of the area. <laughs> so, let me show you. Uh, right there. That is the moment right there. Oh, okay. So, while well, the. He, he has picked up the rabbit, and he, he's picked up the hat, and he is the fixing the table. You see that? It, it that... does so well, it actually fools the cameraman, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cameraman cut away. We need to see how the trick is done, cameraman. Yeah. Not supposed to be there at all. That's supposed to be on a hook, right around, around the back of the table. You see, like that. Yeah. So we can't see where where Paul Dennis is doing, unfortunately. And we now see that he has the hat in his other hand. So obviously, at some point, while everybody's distracted, he's probably bringing the rabbit up, grabbing it into the hat. And then turning the hat around and immediately pressing it up to his body, so that way the rabbit cannot just try to fall, won't fall out, or try to escape. Yeah, well, the yeah. rabbit just magically got there. So either way, it's impressive. Either way, it's impressive. So yeah, uh, now uh, with his uh, handling with the rabbit after he's conjured it. Uh, so there, he's got the rabbit now on stage. How did he handle the rabbit afterwards? You notice that he kind of like put the rabbit down and he coaxed it out of the hat. He didn't pull it out. He didn't grab it by the ears, by the scruff, or even try to uh, scoop it up underneath of its uh, underneath of its body. Yeah, he 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 dumped it out like a like a well cold soup to go with the cold logic. Uh, I wouldn't say it was cold. He was very gentle with it. And he let the rabbit onto the uh, the table, so that way it was taken. It was uh, had all of its balls on a solid surface, and it could just do whatever it wanted. And the rabbit's so well trained, it immediately jumped right back into the hat, so it could do its little ending right there. Obviously, where it felt nice and cozy, probably. Well, it's a silk hat; it's very comfortable. Yep. So obviously, Paul Daniels does a very good job of taking care of his hat and taking care of his rabbit. The hat's more important. The, hat, the hat's the big money maker. <laughs> and as you can see from the hat, he's clearly not taking this well of care of that. As you can see, it's kind of battered, beaten up. It's got bits to it. <laughs> Proton Sucker, I don't believe it. He's a magician. He used magic. Yes. Yes, he did. He did use actual magic. Mm -hmm. Gotta be tricky of those mat. Gotta be wary of those tricksy mages. Yep. So now I'm going to show another rabbit from a hat routine. And we're going to rank this one. See how well people do this. 
Uh, so this is, of course, the classic duo. And, and tell her, ladies and gentlemen. Hit and tell her. Uh, performing for Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show. Uh, hopefully this video doesn't get me taken down. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah. So we just have to... We just have to talk about uh, Nazis or something, right? Oh, wait, hold on. I'm, I don't know if I'm still online. Oh wait, am I am I the host now? Do I have to do things? I I don't know. I'm not ready to entertain a crowd. I don't know anything about magic. I'm just a mollusk. Um. Um. Hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't really know what else to talk about with magic. Um. Let's see. Hmm. Well, I guess it's a magical that I'm a mollusk in space. You demand entertainment. Well, I demand that you don't demand entertainment from me because I am not that entertaining. Have you seen any of the videos I've uploaded? No, oh, I actually haven't uploaded in a while. I've been so busy. Life is hectic. Why do we keep putting up with it? Um... Pull a rabbit out of my mouth, but um, I, I don't know if I can pull a rabbit out of my mouth. I don't have Photoshop open, and I don't have a picture of a rabbit, and I'm not very good with Photoshop. Like like this Photoshop, this was just easy to do. The alternative is not so great. I don't know what the alternative is, but we must avoid that at all costs. Hmm. Okay, Dr. Crow says he's coming back. Phrasing. Uh, in the meantime, I guess I can just ramble, but I don't know what to ramble about. Oh, good, you're back. All right, I'm back, I'm back. I don't know what happened. I completely lagged out there. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought it was all on my end. Uh, I, I thought, oh no, I'm lagging so much. The video isn't, uh, the video isn't playing. No, it was uh, my end. Hopefully... Uh, Proton Stalker made a comment in the uh, chat. I saw that the video is um, anti-cryptic or something, so it may by it may not play. <laughs> yes, um, I was saved by the crow. Now I don't have to explain why why the alternative to life being hectic is. Uh, I think it's more of my uh, my internet being mm. faulty. Mm. <laughs> so you don't have to explain what now. Uh, so I don't have to explain why the alternative to life is worse. I yes, hope that's... Yes, it is. <laughs> All right. So let's continue on with watching. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, uh, before we start, I just wanted to say, uh, I know you're supposed to be on the other day, and that's when I had my accent on yeah. my finger. Thank you so much for coming back on, because you know I love you well, so thanks much. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks. And I wanted to congratulate you. Then I'll do it now. Tim's Vermeer, if you've ever seen this documentary, uh, you, you directed Tell it. Tell right? the director. Yeah, yeah. I I produced it. We wrote it together, yeah. Watch this documentary. You won't even believe what you see. It's something I, I, I just can't even describe, but uh, uh, fascinating. I didn't want it to end, but anyways, it's on iTunes and, and Netflix, and check it all out. It's it's just, anyways, congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Thank you for making that movie. Uh, just want to say the taller guy stopped. looks like one of my old bosses. Pin? <laughs> Pin looks like one of your old bosses. That's kind of terrifying. Yeah. Just a bit, though. Just a bit. Hmm. Uh, working. I'm so happy you're here. I thought you would never come back to New York. Yeah, well, it was, it was tough. 
Yeah, it's tough because we're we're in Vegas, and it turns out when they name the theater after you and paint your picture <laughs> 300 feet tall on uh, the side of the hotel, yeah. and you tell them we want to go a different place to do a show for a while, they get angry. <laughs> 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 I love Ben's uh, cold humor like that. It's just like, <laughs> who knew? They're like, Vegas, so when they get angry, it matters. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah screw <laughs> around. That's, you Don't monkey here. with them. So you're only here till August. Just doing six weeks. Six, six weeks, August, August 16th. 16th. Penn and Teller on Broadway mm -hmm. com mm -hmm. to get tickets if you want to go check this out. Uh, I, 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 what, what, what tricks are you performing at uh, on uh, during the show? Well, we're doing, we brought stuff we haven't done outside of Vegas ever. We're going to be, uh, we vanish uh, an elephant on stage, which has been done in New York since Houdini. We're doing All right, I'm going to skip over the interview just a little bit. Yeah, are they going to do a flip? I want to see him do a flip. <laughs> do magic, a flip. Right? <laughs> yeah, flips are magic. A long time. Uh, <laughs> And, and always something original, always something different. And we've been on The Tonight Show with Don Rickles, which is <laughs> all that really matters. That's what really matters. <laughs> Don Rickles was out here. I know exactly. Uh, but every time you always come up with new and original and fresh takes on everything, that's what I got to respect about you guys. You should never stop. And, and, and so what are you doing? What trick are you doing for us tonight? Well, you know, uh, Teller asked me if I'd ever seen a magician pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I realized I'd never seen that trick. And then Teller told me he hadn't either. And that's weird because that's a cliche. You know, when someone recognizes me, they had me recognize me in Times Square, they'll go, hey, magic boy, pull a rabbit out of your hat. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And if you're going to draw, if you're going to draw a magician, you draw a top hat and a wand and a hat. And yet I'd never seen that trick live. And maybe some of you haven't either. And, uh, and there's reasons for that. One is it's really hard magic. It's wicked hard. And another reason is it's kind of anachronism. In 19th century France, where that became a cliche, in a formal gathering, people wore top hats, you know? Yeah. But now, unless someone's really into cosplay or, you know, there's a steampunk convention in town, <laughs> you don't see them very steampunk, often. Could, could, yeah. could, could, we, uh, could we loan this to you for a moment? Sure. Just for... All right, just pausing a quick bit for bots. Yeah, also... Yeah, uh, Proton make a uh, Proton Stalker made a good point that uh, we have to incessantly correct them. They're not tricks; they're illusions. Uh, actually, no. Illusion is something totally different from a trick. Uh, all yes. illusions are trick. All illusions are tricks. Not all tricks are illusions. Ooh, but um, the rabbit appears out of magic, so it's obviously an illusion. No, it's a conjuring. Oh, a uh, conjuring. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll but probably actually do a, a video about the different types of magic. Uh, but the basic idea is that a conjuring is making something appear. And an illusion is a large prop that requires two or more people to work. Oh, okay. Uh, and another thing, when I, if I do that video, is that uh, most terms in magic are very, very loose. <laughs> Always get your terminology right. That it's very important. Yeah, the, the terminology is almost very loose when it comes to a lot of stuff. I'm oh, sorry, I used the wrong word. It wasn't an illusion. It was an a illusion. 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 Yeah. illusion. So, guys, once you get get a sense of it, and try it on a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, what magicians will do? That's good. Is they will use a representation of a top hat, like they'll have a a handkerchief, which just is called silk, and they'll draw a top hat on it and then do some silk tricks. Mm -hmm. And then from a picture of a top hat, they'll do a, they'll show their hand empty and then pull out a rabbit. But that's a rabbit out of a handkerchief. It's out of a silk. It's not a real top hat. And it's also not a real rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what's called a... <laughs> I love this prop. I need to get one of these props. I really do. <laughs> Kicker. They're sold at magic stores. It's a piece of spring with some fur on it. And if you puppeteer it properly, and Teller does, it looks like a real rabbit from, you know, back of the fourth balcony or something. Sure. And it solves a lot of problems. You can do things with a with a kicker you can't do with a real rabbit. You can press this, you can palm it. You can also hide it up your sleeve. Ah. And it also solves the ethical problem. Over the past few hundred years, humanity's sphere of compassion has grown, and we now want animals treated with compassion, dignity, and respect. <laughs> <laughs> I love that about Penn's humor. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I do suggest using a kicker if you can't afford a rabbit or don't want to use a rabbit. Um, kickers are fantastic if you learn how to puppet them correctly because people probably won't ever know that they're not real if you don't tell them straight up. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> but but would you have to take care of it as well as you take care of a rabbit? Uh, not as well. It's a little bit easier so long as you don't get uh, them wet. Or you don't abuse it or like leave it in its curled up in its spring. Uh, we're not going over the care for a kicker in this video, though. You may have never seen that trick, but no. if we have, does anybody have a top hat? Do you get we buy this top hat? <laughs> sure. Is, is it empty? Did you check it out? It's empty. And you, yeah, I and just you collapsed it. it and you open it up. Yeah. I want you to know it's empty. I'm going to show it to the audience, but it's black on black. And here's the wand. And here's the trick, Jimmy, you may have never seen. Borrow top hat, magic gesture, two taps, and out of the hat comes a <laughs> rabbit. That's hockey puck. The rabbit. <laughs> <Hockey> <laughs> That's a real rabbit. I want to make this very clear. Out of this song, this you were treated with compassion <laughs> and, and respect. Is that sure. Cool? Sure. Yeah. sure. Oh my that, God. That's hockey puck. That's the rabbit. Ladies and gentlemen. Now you've seen a rabbit out of the hat. Head and tell her, ladies and gentlemen. Head and tell her. All right. And that's Pin and Teller's uh, routine. Yay. There was a rabbit in his hat. Yeah, there's rabbit in his hat. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, I'm very curious. We're not going to go over the kicker itself. Uh, but where exactly do you think uh, Teller loaded in that lap rabbit? Yeah, chat. Where do you think? I can't hear you. Yeah. So what about you, Space Junk? Where do you think? Um, well, it was when he handed the hat to the uh, to the other guy. Um, the other guy... Uh, Kept uh, that near his uh, bo- uh, near his pocket. Uh, so uh, when Pin, the tall dude, gave it to Teller, the short dude. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you, you collapsed it. it. You opened it. it. Yep. Open I it. want you to know it's empty. I'm going to show it to the audience, but it's black on black. And here's the wand. Yeah, and right the there. Just right like there. Never seen. Yeah, if you watch Teller very carefully, what Pin is doing is he's doing the misdirection with the wand by spinning it around. You see Teller handing him the wand from his inside coat pocket. But if you watch Teller, you notice his hand keeps going further back when he gets the hat. Yeah. So we'll watch. So you see Teller's hand. It's way behind him now. But with his body blocking it, you won't ever notice unless it's pointed out to you. Mm. Or you're pay- uh, or you're avoiding the red herrings. Because I don't like yeah. fish. You don't like fish, you know. The wand. And so the you trip, see that? Jimmy. And there's you get, just push the rabbit right on in. Uh, and Penn's doing all this stuff with the wand, and Teller's already ready to go. That That's how fast these two are, and that's how well done they are, this dual act like this. And that's why they're the best. <laughs> Having four hands is way easier to work with than just two. Um, Proton Stalker says, from the pocket, it does come from a pocket, but it's a special pocket in the back of Teller's suit. It's not the same pocket that he has on the inside. Yeah, yeah well, I assumed it was the pocket he has his handkerchief in, but um, I don't know if there's enough room in that pocket. No, it's not that pocket. Uh, so that was Pin and Teller. Now, as for their care for the rabbit, obviously, uh, Pin's speaking loudly to the rabbit, asking it, is it well cared and properly treated? And of course, the rabbit's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then Teller goes off to have people pet the rabbit because people want to pet the rabbit. And he's obviously got crowd control. He's taking the rabbit to who he chooses there at the end and not letting it just a whole bunch of massive people come up to pet the rabbit. So, yeah, rabbit's totally taken care of the entire time. Mm -hmm. All right. And that brings us to just about the end of our lesson. I hope it was informative. Do you feel like you've learned something, Space Oyster? Yes, I've learned that you can conjure rabbits into hats. Yes. Rat- hats are the natural spawning environment for a rabbit. Mm. Uh, what about you, uh, uh, Crow Chat? <laughs> and then they cook them and eat them. Yes. Yep, and that is what rabbits are for. They are livestock, after all. Yep. I hope the chat has felt like they have learned something. Mm. Uh, but before we go... I found one more performance of a rabbit from Hat that is guaranteed to be rememberable. Memorable. Memorable. Remember, remarkably rememberable. This is going to be something special. These are a pair of magicians I don't think I've shown off before named Barry and Stuart. 
Uh, and after this performance, you'll probably see why I've I've never shown this before. Uh, get ready for this. <laughs> okay, I will um, hold on to something. Um, yeah, hold on to something. This is going to uh, this is going to be something. Uh, so I apologize about the video's low quality. It is obviously ripped from a DVD at some point. <laughs> Yeah. It's max quality is 240. <laughs> and that reminds me of one of the one of the people I watch for Fire Emblem stuff. The real trick is to pull a hat from a rabbit. <laughs> uh -huh. I've seen that gag. That gag is hilarious. It's the famous rabbit from the hat trick. And we're gonna need someone to help us from the audience. I've all in oh, oh no. Let me start from the beginning. Perform for you now, a real classic of magic. It's the famous rabbit from the hat trick. And we're gonna need someone to help us from the audience. A volunteer. You. you. <laughs> yes, you. Come on up here. Come on. <laughs> What's your name? Paul. Paul. Paul, I'm Stuart. Paul, I'm Barry. Hi. Paul. The magician's most famous trick, pulling a rabbit from a hat, was actually inspired by the story of Mary Toft. Paul, in 1726, Mary allegedly gave birth to 17 rabbits. It all began when Mary felt terrible abdominal pains. She grabbed her belly and fell to the ground. The local midwife was alerted and helped Mary deliver 17 rabbits. <laughs> Soon after, a quick-thinking magician, John Henry Anderson from Aberdeen, took to the stage and pulled a rabbit from an empty hat. And thus, the cliché was born. Tonight, we're going to take the trick back to its roots. But we're going to present it in a way John Henry Anderson was not brave enough to perform. I'll get the hat. Uh, so, yeah, they went over the, the, the actual start. That story they told about Mary Toff at the beginning, giving birth to 15 rabbits, is true. You weren't here for that, Space Oyster. But, yeah, that, that's a thing that happen it was a hoax um and magicians that um, allegedly a magician at the time took advantage of it although it wasn't proven until much later that anybody actually did that hmm. uh, wait so so there uh was their father a rabbit uh es essentially mary claimed she got attacked by a monstrous rabbit and uh gave birth to a bunch of rabbits no oh, is that is that where how that uh, one horror movie came around? I, I swear there's a horror movie with giant rabbits. Oh yeah, there is a horror movie of giant rabbits, uh, Night of the Lang uh, the Lupin. Yeah. Uh, or Lupus? I don't know. Lup Night of the Lupus, yes. It was a it's a horror movie where they had rabbits running around a miniature set. Um, basically, it is, a, it is a goofy. It's one of those goofy, goofy horror movies. I really want to see it. It sounds adorable. Yeah, because they try so hard to treat it seriously. And they like slow down the footage of the rabbits running about to try to make them seem bigger. <laughs> uh, and of course, they have giant puppets of like, the people would hold on to while being attacked by the rabbits that made it look like they're being killed and whatnot. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see about that. All right. I'd like you to step this way. Let's examine the table. I want you to make sure there are no rabbits concealed. Have a look on top, have a look underneath. Make sure there are no springs, mirrors, trapdoors. And when you're happy, say, I'm happy with the table. I'm happy with the table. Oh, look, here comes. All right, so nothing weird with the table. Yeah. That makes the table very suspicious. Yeah, so. At this point, I would like to just say goodbye to any chances of being monetized. And here we go. Body. <laughs> Paul, this is Natasha. She's going to play the part of our hat. Yeah. <laughs> the hat is prepared. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then the hat goes on the table. 
<laughs> no, Paul. Let's examine the hat. <laughs> I want you to make sure there are no rabbits concealed. Have a look on top, have a look underneath, make sure there are no springs, mirrors, tap doors. And when you're happy, say I'm happy with the hat. <laughs> I'm happy with the hat. Paul, before the show began, Stuart and I had a game of Twister. And because I'm the bendiest, I won. That means I get to be the magician this evening. So, Paul, <laughs> if we just step back over here and we'll let the magic begin. All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was like his first time seeing that. It would have been mine, too. John <laughs> Stalker. All right, that's more like it. <laughs> uh, Proton, no! <laughs> God. The original. Rabbit from the hat. Paul, if you could just hold my, <laughs> my watch. watch. <laughs> Push! Oh, it's a funny bouncing baby boy. Let's call it Paul. Let's call it Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, came across that in my studies, and I was like, I gotta show it. <laughs> yeah. So that was entertaining. <laughs> what do you think of that, Space Oyster? <laughs> that was very entertaining. I always love to have other people play the part of the hat. Yes. <laughs> and that is my channel. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to get some comments on that one from everybody else who didn't get to see this live. <laughs> <laughs> Proton Stalker, she passes the rabbit test. <laughs> she, she did. She passed the rabbit test. <laughs> I love the reaction from everybody. Uh, Proton Stalker is like, yay, Pixie, my wife, and Space Junk are like, no, stop, no. <laughs> so that's going to be it for this lecture today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. I hope you found it informative and educational and entertaining. <laughs> mm -hmm. And always remember to get alternative hats if you can't afford a real one. Yes, you always get a turn of hats, and I hope this information helps you proceed forward in your quest to become a better magician. It's been a wonderful trip through history about the ma magical rabbit from a hat. <laughs> All right, and of course, if you're interested in the things that my cast, like Space Oyster here, does... All their links are down in the video below, as well as the links to all the videos I used on the show today. Um, if you're interested in seeing more of the stuff I do, I write a comic called Smoke and Mirrors. You can follow that link down below. And, of course, like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. And, of course, share. Tell them that there's a special surprise at the very end. <laughs> Wait, there is? <laughs> yeah, we just saw it. Oh. All right. And that's going to be it for me today. I am Dr. Crow. I read a book once. And it's my goal to make you smile. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>